Good, good afternoon, good evening. Good evening from New Delhi and welcome from wherever you are. I am Sandeep Chachra, Executive Director of Action Aid Association and your moderator for this session today. A very, very warm welcome to all of us who are here and to our esteemed panelists, organizers. This is the ninth in the series of our fortnightly plan. Uh, friends, a bit on this initiative. This initiative is with the leadership of Agrarian South Network, a tricontinental research platform in co-partnership with Action Aid Association India and the Sam Moyo Institute of Agrarian Studies, Zimbabwe. Dialogue is supported by a number of organizations and I acknowledge with gratitude the support of Center for Informal Studies and Labor Studies at JNU, the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, the Global University of Sustainability, Hong Kong, China, the Federal University of ABC Brazil, Professor Paris is here, including the postgraduate program in the World Political Economy, the Department of Educational Technologies and Language Unit, and the Office of the Provost for Outreach and Culture. Uh, these are the, some of the main organizations supporting the dialogue series. This is, as I said, the ninth in our dialogue series, Spectres of Crisis, Rays of Hope. Friends, uh, these dialogues will be in English, and I'll and on Facebook Live, if, if, you, if you are there, then welcome. Uh, recorded videos will appear later, both with Portuguese and Spanish subtitles, but that'll be later. We encourage written questions in all languages uh, when, whenever the question answer session begins. And uh, you can ask your question in your language. It will be translated for us. As you know, friends, we are meeting at a very, very interesting time. Uh, the US elections counting has just is just about starting, Professor Silva. Uh, it should be second, just about ending, yeah. 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 For the second day, I guess it, it would. And, and yeah, it's just about ending. And matters are at a very critical stage. You've all been following, I hope. Uh, some have even called the elections. Some have called it almost a stolen election. Uh, our session today actually is focused on US elections in the context of uh, the crisis of global capitalism. Uh, so this, this is the wider context that we are in and to reflect on the US elections in the context of the crisis of global capitalism and what's going to be in store for majorities in the US, but not just in the US, uh, what's going to be in store for majorities of our planet, uh, given the US's influence. We have with us to, uh, here today a very eminent scholar and thinker, Dr. Beverly Silva. Very warm welcome, Dr. Beverly Silva. Uh, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Beverly Silva, uh, friends, is from the Arigi Center at the John Hopkins University in USA, and uh, she will be delivering. I'm, I'm delighted and honored to be hosting you, Dr. Silva. She'll be delivering the key talk this evening. And then uh, following Dr. Silva and to discuss his views on the current juncture, we have Dr. Ricardo Jacobs. Dr. Ricab Ricardo is at the University of California, Santa Barbara, USA. Uh, Ricardo will follow. Uh, we'll have a question answer session towards the end, so do stay on. And uh, I now would uh, take, I have the honor and the pleasure of inviting Dr. Silver uh, for your address at this very, very interesting juncture. Uh, Dr. Silver, over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to just start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. I'm extremely uh, honored and pleased to be participating in this series. I've been following the series since the beginning. Uh, and I also want to you know, start out by uh, saying that Professor Sam Moyo is on my mind today, that uh, he was a, a close comrade and colleague and uh, was one of the founding International Advisory Board members of the Arigi Center when we established it back in 2012. And uh, at the same time, also Professor Giovanni Arigi is on my mind uh, as we try to look forward and face the current period of global crisis of capitalism and this moment, which is both one of danger, but also where we find rays of of hope, strong rays of hope. 
So when we agreed on this date, which was the morning after the election in the United States, it was, it was already clear at that time that there was a high probability that we wouldn't, we wouldn't know the answer. Uh, in other words, we wouldn't have the results of the election, uh, it, in part because there's a huge increase in the number of people who are voting by mail and that there are all these restrictions on when the mail-in votes could be counted. They, in some states, they can't begin counting them until after the, the, the election day or the, uh, the election day itself. And so there was just a general um, sense that in fact, if it, it, it may come down that we wouldn't know the, the answer. Uh, when uh, at the same time, you know, I said, this is not really an issue because uh, what, what we really need to be focusing on is not necessarily the outcome of the election, but the, the bigger dynamics of the uh, crisis of global capitalism, um, the crisis of US hegemony and the implications of that, of the decline and crisis of US hegemony for uh, peace and well-being in livelihoods in the, in, in the world as a whole. So. Um, uh, physical, physical security, livelihood, um, safety, and, and peace. So in some ways, the election matters a lot. The results of the elections matter a lot. And from some other points of view, uh, similar uh, dynamics of crisis are going to be with us regardless of the outcome of the election. Um, I do believe um, that if uh, Biden turns out to be the election, uh, turns out to win, particularly uh, if there's Democratic control of the Senate, that it creates a field where there's a possibility to develop a, a, a left uh, response to the crisis um, that, uh, you know, that can take us forward. In other words, it provides for, for a, a potentially a uh, more favorable field for uh, left pol political action, but there's no guarantee um, that that action would be successful. And in, in fact, uh, may uh, for various reasons, which I'll get into set up for a return of a Trump, what we, call, might, what we might call Trump 2.0, which is like a Trump uh, that is uh, in some ways more, more dangerous. So um, I wanted to uh, talk for a minute about uh, first, you know, uh, I, I sent a um, an abstract, you know, where I referred to the Trump as a fascist project, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit first about, um, you know, why I'm using the terminology, and then why um, I think that between 2016 and 2020. Um, rather than seeing a weakening of this fascist project, we've seen actually many ways in which it's uh, been entrenched uh, with, within uh, the United States. And so again, regardless of the outcome of the election, there's a, a strengthened fascist project within the United States, which has a strong uh, possibility of uh, either remaining in power or coming back in power in four years. And so that the, the, the urgent challenge is to understand why it uh, emerged and what, uh, and what, if anything, can be done to, to stop it. And then uh, if not, uh, then what are, what are the options uh, within that situation? So uh, back in August, 2016, Trump, uh, return from a surprise visit to Mexico uh, to give a speech in Arizona. And I remember uh, watching it on TV and, you know, just like uh, saying, okay, this, this, uh, this is a fascist project. I mean, the, the levels of uh, racism, uh, xenophobia, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, and uh, uh, picking on the weak and vulnerable and uh, militaristic nationalistic uh, language was uh, unmistakable. But uh, I went back in preparation for this talk to, um, read the, uh, to, to, to read the speech. 
And I, what I, you know, what I, what everyone understands and, and it's clear is that it's not just a question of reading the speech, but it's a question of seeing the, the interaction between Trump and um, the, the attendees at his rallies, you know, so that this kind of um, what becomes, you know, what we've increasingly seen as an emergent kind of vigilante, kind of white supremacist, neo-Nazi type of vigilanteism that's been empowered. And you, you could already see it happening uh, back in 2016, and then it's become uh, stronger over the past four years. Um, over the past four years, when Trump was elected, you know, and I think this is this is a familiar in a lot of countries. There, when he, when he was first elected, and it was uh, the the Republicans had both the um, the the White House and the uh, and Congress. You know, both both branches of both houses of Congress. There was a sense, okay, that that at least there's the courts. That in other words, that the judiciary will put a a block on this. And I think that you know what I think again. Um, the what the the Republicans and particularly McConnell, you know, in terms of evil genius, um, had uh, been aware, and I think that it, it took others by surprise that they've been holding out, um, refusing not just to uh, uh, Obama's Supreme Court nomination at toward the end of his presidency, but also lower court federal nomination. So that when Trump came in, there was something like 147, if I've got the number correctly, um, judicial judicial seats that had that were um, that were available for him to fill. So they basically packed um, not just you know three. Supreme Court appointed as well with um, with far right uh, judici uh, judges, which is going to have a, a long term impact. Um, then the other thing people are saying as well, you know, he's just this individual buffoon and he has no uh, organization. Um, and uh, and in, what what's happened, in fact, is that the Republican Party has uh, acquiesced, has base uh, acquiesced is not even the word, but you know, has become his willing organization. And so he actually has a rather strong and capable organization. So this idea of dismissing him as some kind of crackpot individual was always misguided, but has become increasingly so over time. Um, I've already spoken to this bold name of neo-Nazi clan type, clan type or there's a long history in the United States of this, but uh, they, they had mostly uh, been, uh, you know, pushed into the shadows, into the margins, and Trump, you know, through his various, uh, what, what he referred to as dog whistle now, referred to as bullhorns, has completely empowered uh, these kind of to come out, uh, both uh, in in um, kind of racist and anti-immigrant violence, but actually more importantly, and this is again the kind of just element to it, is um, is this uh, stating of the left. left is not strong enough to actually uh, take power, you know, or it seems influence uh, once it does. But, you know. So, you know, one is it's controlled by people uh, who, liberals who want to have it both ways, you know, um, and, and they're, you know, and they end up uh, appealing to nothing and nobody. And then, um, um, the, 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 even so that the, 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 the difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is the Republican Party is much more um, uh, vicious, uh, much more uh, determined to get power, maybe exactly the reasons for this, but uh, already back in, uh, in response to 2000, uh, uh, Bush v. Gore, you know, the uh, when Bush 
was installed by the Supreme Court. Uh, there was a commentator who said the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats is that the Republicans go for the jugular, whereas the Democrats go for the capillaries. So that it's like they, you know, it, it, so it's we're, we're in trouble. So there, um, the final thing that I just wanted um, to say about the situation, like in, in terms of the last few years as a past, as opposed to, I'll get to a bit more of a, a, a longer uh, term, longer durée global focus in a minute, but, um, is but it's but it's important um, is this question of the expiration of uh, 1964 civil rights legislation, which again the Congress just let uh, expire. So in the 1964 uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, there was legislation. There were provisions that made it very diff more difficult to repress the vote or to. Um, particularly, you know, the African-American vote. And, and so, uh, but, um, and, and, and those provisions were allowed, uh, they needed to be renewed after 50 years. So they should have been renewed in 2014 and they were allowed to ex expire. So this is a short, I mean, it, it, it's like a conjunctural issue, you know, of the last few years that explains why it help, it helps to explain why the voter uh, suppression has gotten so much more uh, visible and ugly, and uh, uh, you know, in terms of people just being kicked off the rolls, you know, polling places being uh, shut shut down. I mean, it was you know, I, it was difficult for me to find out where to go to go vote. It was difficult for me for actually to find the place. You know, I, I, and and I've got you know lots of uh, tools in my hand to to be doing all those things. So. Um, but the, the important thing, um, you know, that's a kind of short term thing, but the important thing is that, you know, the United States, you know, as a democracy has always been a democracy that has rules built in to protect it from the people, right? So the, the electoral college, among other things, you know, um, that the, the fact that the voting day is on a regular work day, it's not a national holiday, you know, there are all sorts of things that are meant to make it difficult uh, for, for people to vote. So it's a democracy. So e even with, you know, without Jim Crow, with, uh, without, um, without the, the uh, you know, um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's always, it's been um, something where it's been built in, but what's happened I think in 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 the last years is that uh, because because it's so um, um, be, because it's uh, because actually there's the, the 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 democracy was going to produce uh, results that were not in the interests of the elite that you start seeing these mechanisms of voter repression getting pulled out more and more and more and used more and more um, openly, okay? So, um, you know, a, a lot of people, um, I wanna like roll back. And actually, let me just say that this um, democracy that's protected from the people, you know, it has its parallels in the kind of institutions that the United States set up or, after the Second World War, including you know you have the United Nations where you have uh, one one country one vote you know so you allegedly a democratic institution but it's protected from democracy by Security Council you know and all of the institutions um, that were set up that had some you know allegedly that had some democratic uh, uh, appeal or claim you know were all set up in ways that uh, protected. Uh, democracy from the majority of the world's population in international institutions. And that's something that I'll uh, come back to at, at the end. So, you know, I'm trying to think about um, the difference, you know, 19, between the 1960s uh, and the last uh, few years in the United States. So, um, you know, we have uh, both globally 
and in the United States, the 60s and the present are periods of um, mass social protest, mass so social unrest. You know, it was periods where, you know, vast swaths of the world's population within the United States and across the world are expressing discontent with the uh, the current social setup, you know, and 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 uh, raising major uh, radical challenges, and the response. Um, looking at it first from within the United States, you know, if you think about uh, what the difference is between um, the terrain on which, say, the civil rights uh, movement was playing, and the global terrain on which current social justice movements are uh, playing out in the United States. One is the, the, is the geopolitical context. So in 68, uh, in the 60s, I don't mean 68, but in the 60s, these movements are playing out in the context of uh, Cold War competition between the United States and, and Soviet Union and socialist bloc. And the United States government um, was very concerned about what the rest of the world thought and that the televised repression of civil rights uh, activists uh, was, was a problem. It was, you know, this, because it was a problem in a moment, not just of the Cold War competition, but the Cold War competition in the height, in the context of um, emerging national liberation, emerging and empowered national liberation movements and um, rising socialist movements. And, um, and so th the United States government was concerned to actually concerned to about appearing racist in the eyes of, uh, or as like undemocratic, undemocratic and or racist in the eyes of the, of the world. Um, and I think today, you know, we see equally shocking, uh, forms of televised repression of demonstrations in the United States and, you know, after uh, heavily militarized uh, police repression. Um, but, you know, there's a sense that, you know, the U.S. is, you know, doesn't care what the rest of the world thinks, right? And so um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I don't think in the U.S., it's normally thought of that one of the things that allowed for the progress in social justice in the, in the earlier decades was this kind of um, monitor, monitor, monitoring, if you want, by the rest of the world and particularly by the third world and the, chip and the likelihood, the, the, the potential that the third world would think badly of the United States, but now there's not that kind of constraint. The um, other, you know, of course, is that, uh, that that in the 60s, the US was still in its uh, rising phase as a, a world economic military power, but, and that also had a, a, an impact in terms of how uh, the, the pie was thought of, you know, a, a growing pie. And, uh, and there were still remnants within the Democratic Party of New, New Deal thinking, whereas today it's now, you know, over 25 years um, that the Democratic Party is a bastion of, uh, of neoliberal thinking, right? So um, I, I will, I think I, I, I won't, ha I don't think I'll take the time now, but I, I will come back in, in later in the discussion if, 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 uh, if it makes sense, but, uh, to this question of the essential workers and the work and and the nature of the working class, I'm 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 I may I, if I have time uh, in the opening remarks, I'll come back to it. But I just think I want to move on. But um, so so I, I've kind of hinted at it, but you know, stepping back, um, I think that uh, you know, in in order to uh, get out of the current situation when also this kind of entrenched fascist uh, project or entrenching fascist project. Uh, and again, it, this, this, is, this is the dynamic we're facing regardless of the outcome of the election, that there's an entrenching fascist project that needs to be beat back and, you know, and, and, and it becomes, it's just a different form of urgency 
depending upon the election result. But it's not that you know Biden winning is going to uh, make make that uh, that problem go away. So uh, I think that you know again there's missed these questions about uh, why uh, um, not only why Trump won in 2016, but why he even has a chance of winning again in 2020, you know, why there isn't a repudiation. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, there's, there's a socioeconomic story, um, there's a geopolitical story, uh, and there's a geopolitical story. And the, the, again, I mean, I've already hinted at the idea that the Democratic Party has been, you know, uh, at the one of the champions of neoliberal policies for the last uh, 25 years and um, presided over a dramatic uh, increase in inequality um, since you know, the, the 1990s. Uh, of course, they've all presided over an increase in inequality, but the, 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 if, if one is to think of the Democratic Party as, uh, as some form of opposition party, and of course that gets into the whole problems of, you know, there only being two parties in the US and, you know, one is the center party, one is the center right party. But um, so what you have is, and, and, and let, let me say that I think that the problem is not so much what has been done in the past, but the failure to acknowledge it. So when Trump wins in 2016, the uh, Democratic Party um, uh, and particularly is just focused on uh, the idea of Russian interference, the idea of, you know, oh, that, that, or that it, that it was a fluke or that, you know, that the popular vote was actually won or, you know, um, so, so the, the, but there's never been a uh, going back to, um, to a, a kind of mea culpa on the role that was played. And I don't know if they'll ever be, unless they do a thorough mea culpa on the role that they have played in creating the problems um, that both the world is facing and the United States is the, both internally and globally the role that they played, that there's no hope that they can actually play a positive role in, uh, in, in you know, going forward in this kind of anti-fascist uh, struggle. So, um, you know, with the, the, I think people are familiar with that Piketty and Say's uh, U-shaped curve, you know, which shows that in the United States, States that inequality was high in the early part of the 20th century up to the Great Depression, then it then inequality decreased dramatically in the post-war decades, and then it started increasing. And, and you know, in, it started increasing in the 80s, but then more sharply in the 90s. And then the, so, so the shocking thing is that after the, the 2008, after Obama won, one would have thought partly, you know, Obama wins, partly we have the 2008 crisis, that there would have been some kind of a serious shifting of, of policies toward, re, toward redistribution rather than increasing inequality. Um, and so, um, you know, as we know, the eight years of Obama were years of uh, growing inequality class inequality within the United States. And, and you know, um, and, and uh, so instead of taking the 2008 crisis as a moment like the 1929 crisis, if you had the 1929 crisis led to a period of eventually, you know, the 1929 crisis, the kind of competition with the, the, the kind of, um, Cold, the rise of the Soviet Union, the competition with communism, the, the you know led to a um, decades-long period of redistribution and rising wages, and you know with all its kind of limitations in terms of which we can get into, you know, in terms of exactly uh, who was left out, you know, kind of the racist nature of these policies, but um, but and. You know, and then the, that it, right, that what we have um, at, from 1982 on is 
a, a, a process where the Republicans run up the deficits by giving tax cuts and by expanding the military. And then the Democrats impose austerity. So you have the, the allegedly more progressive party continuously trying to show that they're fiscally responsible and imposing austerity. And so again, this is there's some interesting things about the 20s, 1920s um, in Karl Polanyi's Great Transformation, where he talks about all these governments that come into power, uh, whether the labor parties, when they're, they come into power in the 1920s and they're so convinced about the importance of going back on the gold standard that they come in power to improve the livelihood conditions of the people and instead they end up imposing austerity. And so what it does is that the left or progressive forces or liberals, you know, whatever, that it, in fact, it didn't matter, they end up uh, weakening themselves in, as, a, as a political force. And so we, this is something we're seeing in, you know, across the board where, um, you know, there's been a, 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 an embracement of neoliberal policy, a bit of austerity, um, where, you know, the, the previously kind of opposition type, uh, anyway. So, uh, so this is, so, you know, Reagan ran up the deficit, Clinton imposed austerity, uh, Bush Jr. ran up the deficit, Obama imposed austerity, Trump has now run up like an, an even greater deficit. If Biden comes in and imposes austerity, you know, then, we'll, then we definitely will have uh, Trump 2.0 in, uh, in, in short order and, you know, within four years and, and a much more uh, kind of Kind of difficult one to 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 break. Um, let me point to the geopolitical, and I'll, I'll also kind of try to end there. Um, that I mean, not end there. Not, I'll come back to to end it. I actually have a couple more things I wanted to say, but um, it's the uh, the attachment to a vast majority of the US population to this idea of being number one, which cuts across, number one in the world, which cuts across the political spectrum, tends to cut across the political spectrum. And I'll, I just wanna put it out and come back to it later. Um, I wanted to say something, I was gonna say something about the K-shaped recovery, but uh, because that also, uh, but maybe we can come back to that uh, in in the um, and and, um, and actually, I just also wanted to 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 make sure I'm not because there's always an implication when I talk about inequality and whatever or stagnant wages that you know one's arguing that the working class is Trump's base, but that is just empirically not the case. So I just because. Be, you know, because of this talk about inequality, I just want to make sure that that, that it's understood that that's not the case. Um, and uh, but we, and I think that in the K-shaped recovery too, that the the um, those post-COVID, that those who are not recovering are also not uh, Trump's base. So. Uh, so. Um, you know, there's what we have. Uh, yeah, okay. I had a section, but I, again, I think I'll, we'll come back to it, but I think it's also, um, you know, about the politics of scapegoating, um, which is uh, something that is going to, uh, that, that's been clear uh, over the past few years and that will become uh, more difficult. But I, I think, um, and, 
And uh, I think that the the you know the 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 question of this. Uh, let me let me. I think I will come back to. I think I'll come back to the whole question of the politics of scapegoating in the discussion, uh, because um, I, I think. But I think that that's again a, a, a it's it's a it's a real danger uh, in, in terms of where things are going, um, and. Uh, I, I, but let me let me come back to it into the dis, in the discussion actually, because I wanted to have time for um, this last bit. Um, so, uh, and this is on um, the U.S. and the global south. So, one thing that's been happening. Um, over the first two decades of the 21st century is the shrinking of the United States as a, its weight, certainly its economic weight on the world stage, um, which is a good thing. Um, uh, and it's been happening 2000, since 2000 and continues to happen today. Um, Giovanni Arrighi in Adam Smith in Beijing made the comment that the real victor of the US war on terror and the US invasion of Iraq was China because up until um, 2000, up until 2001, 2003, the Pentagon was focused on China as its strategic enemy and the US labor movement, uh, the AFL-CIO at the time was also uh, converging into this idea that China and competition from China and from the third world more generally was uh, the, the main source of um, problems for uh, US manufacturing workers. So uh, there was this, uh, and then um, the US got distract, distracted, you know, got pulled, uh, ran into Iraq um, got bogged down in the Middle East and Afghanistan. One of the ideas of pulling out of, um, of Iraq was a, a promise that that would free up US forces to focus, uh, to the, the, uh, Hillary Clinton's idea of the pivot to East Asia, right? And the pivot of US uh, geopolitical focus to East Asia. Um, there's a continued then, you know, the post 20, 2008, um, the shift toward the center of capital accumulation and the center of gravity of the world economy toward Asia and East Asia uh, in particular um, continued. And then again, we're seeing it again uh, with the COVID crisis and the fact that uh, particularly e East Asia, more uh, rapid recovery. Um, I, one way or another, that we're, we're going to see more uh, economic crises to come uh, as far as the U.S. position in the world, at some point there'll be a run on the dollar, uh, further shrinking weight in the world economy, further decline uh, in living standards. So um, what this, the problem is, uh, and partly it links to what I was uh, speaking before about scapegoating and partly because um, the scapegoating discussion I was going to talk about a mixture of internal scapegoating uh, within the country and then external scapegoating and of course external the biggest external scapegoat is China and there's this kind of agreement you know between I mean it was like there were lots of horrifying things about watching the debate between Biden and Trump but you know the a very distressing thing was where they agreed and where they agreed uh, was on getting getting tough on China, right? And that's and that's like, you know, has this long term kind of history. So, so in, um, we can see, you know, two different tendencies, you know, um, and, and they and it's not that they're new, they were already there. Um, the, the, well, they actually uh, date back to kind of U.S. foreign policy in the Cold War, but then they, they, they've reemerged since in various forms since uh, 2000 and coming back again now. But uh, one is, you know, 
this vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, it's this new Cold War. So it's like a kind of uh, building up encirclement uh, um, of, uh, of, ally, of uh, the US trying to get allies to encircle against China. And the, the other is um, what Pinkerton called the happy third. And these are laid out in uh, chapter nine of Origi's uh, Adam Smith in Beijing, where he talks about the, you know, and he's there, he's of course writing, uh, you know, uh, 13 years ago, I guess, um, already, but, uh, uh, but it still holds today. And that's this idea of the happy third, which is the danger in terms of the South China seas and whatever that you get everyone else to fight. Uh, and you stay out of it, right? Um, so I think that um, th this, if if we're again, whether whether Biden or um, Trump wins, this geopolitical context, it, it'll play out a little bit differently, you know. By you know, well, but this geopolitical context of a increasing. Um, uh, hostility toward China, and not just, and it's not just a problem for China because it's an attempt to draw uh, the regional regional neighbors and the global whole into either either choosing sides or you know directly fighting themselves. And so I think if that, if that's one uh, thing that I think, uh, whether in the U.S or in the world uh, elsewhere is to fight against this new Cold War, fight against being drawn into this new Cold War um, and, and fight against uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, kind of effort, which is like rather than adjust to no longer being number one, this tendency to be a bit Samson-like, like bring down just bring down the whole world rather than adjust to a status that of uh, being uh, one among many uh, in terms of power. So um, I'll, let me, I want to end with um, just saying that uh, pointing to um, the, and, and, and I won't take the time, I think, to um, show the uh, pictures now, or right, let's see. Let, I'm going to see if I can share the screen. If I can share the screen, I'll do it. If I can't, I won't. Um, okay, we probably should have, um, is it shared? Yes, it is. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I wasn't aware that it's shared. So this is, um, um, you know, we, we've been, uh, collecting, um, reports of, uh, social protest uh, from 1870 to 2016. You know, we see in the first half of the 20th century, this rising waves of um, social uh, protest. Uh, and then we see the next couple of decades of, of, of uh, very low. And then we have a resurgence here. And if we uh, move the data up to the present, um, will be sort of up here. So we're in the start of what is a, a rising period of, of global social unrest. I mean, I don't necessarily need to show you this to, to be able to uh, understand that. Um, but um, but uh, you know, I think, again, it's maybe a subject for another talk, but if we begin to look at all of these movements, we begin to see uh, not just a rejection of the existing social setup, but uh, demands for a 
transformation of a kind of socialism in the 21st century that would solve problems left behind by um, the declining capitalist powers of the last several centuries, uh, ecology, livelihood, and peace. So I'm, I'm going to stop there, and then I hopefully we'll come back in the Q&A and clarify some things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Silva, for that very overarching ad address. I mean, you touched on several things, uh, very, very interesting things. In particular, I was just thinking through of your comparisons that you drew in the 60s to now and the rise in social protests in the context of a midday, mid-morning, if I may call it, mid-morning America in the 60s to a sunset America, if I may question mark, call it now. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the challenge of uh, the crisis of capital now and the resurgence of at least the protest and the movements and the people's uh, formations in terms of uh, a completely different vision. And, and, and perhaps this whole question of uh, uh, the demos itself. Now, I, I think there, there are many, many issues you touched on. Uh, the, the hopes belied with by Obama uh, in the context of crisis, when we were hopeful that things would really change at the center, but nothing really happened. So could, could we call it a stolen project of, of the Democrats? I, I don't know. There are many questions which arise, uh, but I, I think we, we have a lot of time for very good discussions on the several issues you touched on and the openings you've given us. And I will now have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Ricardo Jacobs, uh, from the University of Santa Barbara, California. Ricardo, Comrade Ricardo, please uh, uh, like to hear some yeah. of your views. And if I may request yeah. you yeah. Uh, uh, to also, yeah. if you can, uh, touch on uh, the question Dr. Silva laid out uh, on, on the issue of working classes and this mm -hmm. popular conception that working classes somehow uh, constitute the base for the Republicans at the moment, given the rise in inequality. Mm -hmm. And where do you see that? Where do you see the question of race, the indigeneity, uh, among, mm -hmm. among the talk that you already may have? Uh, some of the questions I, I, I wish to load on to you as well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Sandeep. And uh, uh, thank you uh, to Professor Silver. I, I will try and keep it short so that we can uh, uh, go to the elections. For me, it's quite remarkable in the process of a pandemic with more than 200,000 uh, deaths and uh, souring unemployment that we had, uh, uh, and the election is undecided. Uh, it's quite, quite for me, remarkable and, and, and quite interesting too. And, and, I, and I think the US elections are pointing to us to the notion of a fascist project. But I want to turn our uh, attention to the neglected uh, part of understanding the current crisis. I would argue it's not Germany or Italy, but South, facet South Africa. And particularly uh, after 1948, when the uh, fascists first come to power, but their re-election in 1953, uh, which, is, which, which has quite interesting parallels because you have this liberal uh, United Party uh, emerging uh, and sort of uh, the, the National Party fascists sort of accusing them of uh, aligning themselves with the with the radical black radicalism of the 1950s, uh, the ANC and others defiance campaign, and even accusing them of supporting the the anti-colonial Mau Mau uprising in Kenya. So it's very interesting that uh, that of course stoked the white electric deepest fear of an African uh, uprising, and of course the National Party wins in a landslide victory. So. So, so, so I think what one has to, to understand this uh, process of fascism today, we have to look at fascist South Africa, sort of what people characterize as late fascism to understand uh, this, this current period. Because in my, 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 my understanding and, and the history of, of this is like very interesting that uh, how fascism and imperialism and capitalism are indivisible as a colonial project, right? And, and I think for us, there's the most important because my view is Nazism uh, emerges in Africa, not, not in Europe. And, and, I, and I think we have neglected to, 
look at the third example, which is South Africa, where you have fascism and Nazism proper until 1994. So uh, the, the characterization of apartheid, in my view, normally obscures uh, what it was proper in South Africa. So, so once we pay, pay our attention to this, what I call the third example, if not, if not the first uh, of fascism, uh, what is interesting is that the fascist ideological appeal has been a, a hallmark of the election campaign. One, uh, one, one scholar uh, sort of, uh, I would say characterize it as fascist with fascist, fascism with fascism and fascism without fascism. Uh, and it's an interesting when we think about its class, its racialized uh, context, as, as Professor Silva has pointed out, that uh, section of the US population. And, 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 and this brings me to the second point about the nature of settler colonial capitalism and imperialism, uh, and the nature in which fascism emerges in these settler colonial enclaves. If you think about South Africa, Australia, the US, uh, in particular in this moment of crisis, uh, where you basically have uh, a sort of racialized consolidation. So, so, so this leads to the question, uh, if, because the narrowness of the election points to, for me at least, that the fascist ideological appeal was mm. successful. And, and, and one of the hallmarks of fascism is, is not it's actualization, it's, it's the potential and the appeal, the logical appeal to sort of draw sections that feels alienated, deprived into the project. And, and my reading of the Democratic Party election campaign was very conservative, that it did not uh, make at least a social democratic appeal, but it, it sort of moved to the center right, uh, and, uh, which, which is what itself was interesting. So, so that leaves us with a question, how are we going to see, uh, as you have pointed out, a counter revolution directed at what people characterize as black, brown and indigenous laboring classes, right? Um, we already know that institutionally, the, there are reports both by the state that the right wing nationalists and white supremacists have already infiltrated key law enforcement agencies of the US, like whether police, uh, intelligence agencies, uh, that's why ICE is, is operating in a particular way. And, and, and so uh, for me, the question is, are we going to see another counter revolution, but directed at uh, the racialized groups within the US, particularly black, uh, Latino and, and indigenous people, right? So, so for me, I think we have to broaden the horizon when we discuss uh, the fascist project. Um, um, and as you see, my own view is that even if Biden wins, it, I think, and is going to implement austerity, even the UND report on trade is warning you can't go for austerity, it's going to be a vital mistake. But all uh, accounts is showing us that that's going to be the trajectory in, in, in the US, uh, which is going to uh, bring up new questions. It's no coincidence that I think that the most radical forces today in, in, in US society is precisely these racialized groups. Uh, it's no coincidence that you had Black Lives Matter uh, emerging against sort of state violence, uh, which is a, one uh, racialized terror, which is one element of fascism. It's no coincidence that you had indigenous uprising with the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, where capital is again penetrating through extractivism uh, new frontiers, even in advanced capitalist countries like the US. And, 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 and I, I guess the Dakota Access Pipeline is one example. Um, so, so let me move on. I don't have much time. I was given uh, four minutes and I'm already uh, past two. Uh, the, 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 the interesting question of US hegemony and decline is quite interesting. And, and I want to raise this question with, um, particularly to you and, and the broader discussion. But what is interesting is the US dollar hegemony has not disappeared. Uh, the, despite the emergence of what the um, uh, People's Bank of China is advocating for a global super sovereign reserve currency, we have seen the, the, the dominance of the US uh, dollar hegemony, particularly during the pandemic where the Fed was quickly to intervene 
and, and, and enforce its discipline and subordination of countries in the periphery. So that's an interesting uh, uh, account that we have to give in terms of what we characterize as the US hegemonic decline, but the dollar hegemony. Of course, people are, are, are saying that is contested, but we have to uh, differentiate again between potential and actual reality. Uh, there might be in future, but, but that is going to be the enforcement that the US uh, is um, I'm, I'm using. Uh, the the Biden-Trump uh, 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 win, and we don't know, it, it, it's quite interesting because it, it leads us to the third point that I want to emphasize is the notion of inter-imperialist rivalry or uh, a spheres of influence, if we can characterize China as an imperialist force. But the, 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 the question of uh, the contestation for spheres of influence and I think, again, uh, if we look at Africa, uh, sort of portends to us of what is coming, where this uh, contestation was through proxy wars. And I think Libya was a, a classic example of, 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 of those, uh, in, at least in my view, in terms of this characterization between uh, China and the US and the EU's uh, control of oil resources. And so, uh, uh, I wonder your view on this notion of the, the this phase of inter-imperialist rivalry, or, or are we going to see it through proxy wars? Mm. Uh, it was interesting that Pompeo went to Japan, uh, North Korea, South Korea to sort of uh, create those type of divisions, uh, and not directly for the U.S. to confront this trade war, but but the emergence of pro proxy wars. Um, the, 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 my, my two last final points, the one relates to the global ecological crisis um, and what uh, both a Trump and a Biden um, uh, result would, 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 would give. And I, and I would use the issue of fracking. Uh, it, uh, it sort of represents to me these two, uh, because both support fracking. Uh, uh, Biden characterized it as a, as a, as a transition phase. Um, and uh, for Trump is that this climate climate crisis, I assume, is hoax and, I, and, and all of this. But uh, for me, the the, the UN uh, just released its human or a few human cost disaster report, uh, which covers 2000 to 2019, past 20 years, and we are already seeing this uh, uh, record levels of uh, disaster events. Uh, particularly floods and storms, particularly in the U.S., which they characterized that resulted in 1.2 million deaths and costing about 2.4 trillion in economic losses. Of course, we know that these uh, is is uh, always um, the impact is always differentiated, and and particularly when I come back and I want to, if, if we're going to pursue this notion of fracking uh, and uh, uh, sort of for the U.S. to get the oil uh, independence, it, it is throwing up the question of indigeneity again, particularly uh, in the Dakota area and where there has been a consistent encroachment in uh, indigenous people's land, but there's also been resistance uh, in, 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 and, and in the, particularly in the most violent ways. And so once we think about the, the global ecological crisis and this notion of uh, Uh, the impact of a global of a, of a, of, a, of a, what what some scholars call the metabolic metabolic shift, basically uh, shifting the burden of an ecological solution onto countries of the global global south. I guess the most obvious example is the is the question of lithium and the imperialist penetration in the countries like Bolivia. Of course, the election reverses that, but at its heart is this notion of an ecological solution. Uh, where solar batteries and all of that, uh, and what would that mean for the rest of the world if we think that uh, a democratic or Biden win is going to put us on a new trajectory? Because of course the Global New Deal is just a new frontier of, of pursuing imperialist logic, um, and uh, the notion that the uh, affluent life in, in the north and it's, it's dependent on what what some have called the robbery. Of other areas in the world, um, and 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 
perhaps and I'm doing it partly as a discussion. Uh, questions and comments, and, and I'm thinking uh, back to the notion of where people, uh, at least some scholars assume that the divide between North and South has been rendered uh, meaningless with the rise of China, uh, which I, of course, question, uh, but I want to get your views on that, if that, if that is a correct interpretation of where we, uh, to understand the current conjunction. Now, uh, my final uh, few points, Sandeep, before I uh, go over, it brings me to uh, what I find the, the most fascinating and um, aspect that we have not focused on is one, the emergence of Black Lives Matter, but the inability, the ability for people to characterize that as identity politics. I would sort of argue against this notion of identity politics of the Black Lives Matter, because we have to sort of uh, focus attention, where, did, where does these struggles emerge? It's in the working class area. Uh, if you mm. think of Ferguson, uh, it's not uh, some middle class identity. Of course, the, the middle class always imposes this ideology, ideology on working class revolts. But if you think about Ferguson, it was against the police violence. It was against the terror of extracting resources from uh, the poor communities through traffic stops, through fines to get the, to, to, for the municipal budget. Um, the, the, the second fascinating aspect for me is this, uh, the payday report has sort of uh, uh, recorded that we've had since March, 1,100 wildcat strikes in the US, right? That precedes the George Floyd um, uprising. Right, And within the uprising, we have also seen the role of labor, but that has not, uh, particularly black labor, we have seen in Minnesota where the black uh, bus drivers refused to, to, to transport um, prisoners or to transport the police. We have seen the longshoremen in, in, in the West Coast at the docks, again, uh, primarily dominated by black workers in a very militant way, uh, supporting Black Lives Matter. and and. And for me, the question is, are we seeing a new wave of struggle or is just, just the flash in the pan of labor struggles? Um, at the same time, I think if we go to the global terrain, for me, the most interesting example, uh, and I'm wondering if this is going to be the response of capital is the national strike that we had in Indonesia, right? What was in interesting about the Indonesian strike is that the state, uh, despite the crisis, is try was uh, one trying to externalize that cost onto laboring classes by saying, oh, we're gonna extend their working day, we're gonna take away reproductive rights of women. Uh, 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 so you had labor, gender and environmental rights and, and sort of uh, going on with the project of deforestation amidst a crisis. Uh, and I wonder if Indonesia is, 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 is sort of uh, a sign of how the ruling classes are going to behave within this crisis of sort of trying to shift that burden onto the, the, the laboring classes. Particularly in the US, of course, it would be, if we think in terms of race, this proportion is going to fall on if we think about the pandemic, that uh, which is quite interesting. And, and here was very puzzling and also not unsurprising that the pandemic has hit Black, uh, Latino, and Indigenous community the most in terms of death, mm. Mm. Uh, which is quite uh, fascinating. So one would have assumed, oh, is there something genetically uh, wrong? But it's the nature of how uh, the burden is very concentrated in terms of class. Uh, terms, because when people assume when they talk about black, brown, and indigenous, I don't, it's not necessarily the, in my view, and I might be wrong, it's not necessarily the upper and middle class, but it's the laboring classes that are disproportionately affected. And, and so this brings me back to, uh, are we going to see again a counter-revolution, but with a very class and racialized uh, tra trajectory uh, within the US, dis despite the outcome of the elections. And that if we use the Indonesian example, that that burden is going to be shifted onto these uh, oppressed classes. Uh, 
uh, yeah, so let me end with that. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very, very interesting, Dr. Ricardo. Thank you mm. for, I share your hopes. Huh? I share your hopes on the Indonesian example. Uh, you arise a number of contradictions as well. Uh, you gave examples of uh, both the uh, sort of uh, uh, context as well as the struggles of the black peoples, but also the indigenous peoples on the question of ecology. Now, there are contradictions there in terms of what's happened to the reservation areas over the last 50 years and how they've shrunk and how the interests of the indigenous and the black peoples may not, or the working classes may not come together, particularly in context of the Occupy movements. But very interesting. Uh, I think the other point that you arise uh, very strongly is the question of the third example of South Africa in the context of uh, the advance of fascism and the models used therein. Uh, I will open up uh, this discussion for questions, comments, commentaries. Uh, people who are on Facebook Live, please uh, put your questions there. Our colleagues will pick it up from there. Uh, members who are here, friends who are here it, at the Zoom, Zoom session, uh, you are invited uh, to make your questions. Uh, you can ask them live or you can let us know in the chat box uh, your questions. We await your questions. And uh, Bill, if you're in, you, you had an early, early question. Would you like to ask it yourself, Professor Bill Martin? Bill, I think you're muted. You, you're muted, Bill. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure I have a question, but, but let me interject for a second here. Uh, we are unable to get you. Uh, your audio is not on, Professor Bill. Your audio is not on. Bill, we can't hear you. I don't know. We can't hear you. Bill, we can't hear you. Can you type? Bill, the organizers, can you can you send Professor Bill a message? I, I don't think you can hear us at all. He's probably not looking at the screen. Bill, can you hear me? I, I, we can't hear you here. Bill, can you hear us? We, we can't hear you. Your audio is not working.
Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Good Lord. We were trying to get across um, to you and and and. You, uh, I can't hear you. Um, maybe you should pass to someone else. If you can hear me, I can't hear you. Um, let me briefly rephrase, I guess. Um, I want to thank Beverly and Ricardo for raising these issues, issues that we don't normally think about the meaning of the US elections in these terms. I sometimes worry that when we use the term fascism to analyze the conjuncture, we're caught in the trap of the writers in the interwar period, Palancis or Polanyi, where we're really looking at European forms of rule. I think trying to anchor it in sort of global crisis, you know, gives us a different kind of edge. And Ricardo points to this when he argues that, you know, if you want to understand fascism, you need to start in South Africa. Um, I think our Namibian friends would contest his South African chauvinism, because I think you can make a good case that Nazi Germany, you know, ground tested and brought the chickens home to roost from Namibia, as, you know, Fanon would, would assert. So, I mean, one of the questions you want to ask is, what does this conjuncture in the U.S. as a global north-south phenomenon mean? Um, and there, I think Trump has been formative. He comes out for a, a lot of previous left positions. I'm sorry, guys. He comes out against NAFTA. He comes out against the endless wars. He won't invade in, in Libya or Syria as, as the Democrats would have done and would do. He comes out against mass incarceration in some ways. And he has the back, backing of, you know, most of, uh, of chunks of the, the hip hop community, my dear friend Ricardo, uh, as you probably know, where Biden has none. I think, you know, Trump is a response to this crisis uh, and the Democrats simply have no response. Uh, Biden gives us, you know, Obama, or sorry, gives us Clinton 3.0. Obama is Clinton 2.0. And, you know, Biden comes along. And if you look at his platforms, he's running largely on the incompetence of, of Trump and his racism and misogyny, all quite clear. But he has no affirmative response to the right-wing peoples or people of color. Um, he really doesn't. And that you can see it in his choice as vice president who advertised herself as a super cop, you know, who defended capital punishment in California. So, I mean, you know, we have this interesting dynamic of what's formative. And then the question is, what does it for North-South relations and for Africa? Uh, Yash Tendon, in response to the 2016 election, said, look, there are good things for Africa about Trump because he's going to weaken U.S. hegemony and U.S. power and be less militarist than the Democrats in power would be. I mean, he wrote a series of, of commentaries in his blog, which were quite striking at the time. It raises a similar question today, right? If Biden wins, although it now looks like the Senate is gonna remain in Republican control. Um, if Biden wins the presidency, you know, what will the future be as the US and Europe try to sustain the old North-South neoliberal order as it crumbles around them? Because it's not just, you know, the US, right? And we're gonna break IMF and the World Trade Organization. You have the same going on in England, the same phenomenon going on in Italy, the same phenomenon going on in Germany, right? Or, or I mean, a new series of more populist leaders, uh, you know, who we face Urban or Orwell. Um, let me stop there um, and thank Ricardo and, and Beverly for forcing me. To... Oh, uh, and I'll see you... if I can get the sound back on my side. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Bill uh, Martin. And uh, would you uh, would you like to give a response, uh, Ricardo and Beverly, even as we get some more questions? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, both Ricardo and Bill, for your comments, which I fundamentally agree with uh, on the question of. Uh, South Africa as, as the model, I think that that, that actually is ex extremely useful. And uh, I, I was going there in the scapegoating discussion uh, at one point, but the, because what, what we have um, is that initially, you know, you have immigrants as the scapegoats, but there's been a blockage of immigrants, then who's going to be the next uh, scapegoats, and it's a combination of some kind of uh, left and uh, racialized working class. And so it seems to me like when I try to think of where this whole thing is headed, this this project, and, it, and again, uh, you know, whether it's like a bumpy road through, if, whether it's a road through Biden and then there, or it's a, uh, a 
no Trump there, but it's uh, what seems to be emerging as some kind of welfare state for whites and misery and violence uh, for the rest. And so, you know, that so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, uh, uh, a fascist apartheid type regime that is the project. So that, which is also what Ricardo was raising, is, is the opposite to the project. And uh, so, you know, and there, I think that's what, what we're also seeing is like a, a strong grassroots opposition. And I think it's extreme, as Ricardo points out, it's extremely difficult to uh, disentangle race and ethnicity and indigeneity and class in the current context in the United States because the essential workers are fundamentally uh, uh, black and Hispanic and indigenous, less indigenous, the more indigenous is on living on land that is being used for extractivist uh, purposes. So there's this clash um, that's being set up, which uh, to, uh, to me is, is, is a fundamentally class uh, conflict within, in, uh, but that, um, that the, que the question uh, then becomes uh, this, in whether a uh, increasingly um, militarized violent response can succeed or not. And that's the, the fight that's going on now. And maybe, um, uh, and then there's a debate, I think whether um, that, that fight, the, the terrain for that fight is going to be easier or not, um, depending on the results of the election or it, it, it's, a, it's a tough fight. Um, in any case, um, on the only thing on the, I'm less, I mean, again, Trump has picked up some of the language uh, and projects of the left and the critiques of capitalism, but I don't believe, I mean, I don't, I think it's a, you know, it, 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 it's a mistake to, to think that he's actually uh, going through with those things. I mean, it's, 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 this, it's socialism in the sense of national socialism, you know, whether it's a South African version of it or, uh, uh, you know, so also the, the apartheid regime, you know, there was a welfare state for, for, uh, for whites, you know. So, uh, and an increasingly kind of, uh, I, I think the other, in, thing about the South Africa US comparison today is that one thing that South Africa had in common was not just the internal repression, but that it was a cancer in the region, you know, and that it, and so, and so I, I really think that uh, um, the, um, uh, you know, that, that it, I, I, I'm really uneasy with this idea that Trump is less militaristic. I think they, they both are. That's one thing that US policy has that that's characteristic of US policy uh, in the US and the world is this expansionist militaristic uh, uh, the, you know that it, the expansionist militaristic dynamic you know which China doesn't have right but uh, but if you um, yeah so so let me leave it there so that's my only uh, worry is uh, or disagreement I think I think that's my main disagreement with Bill um, is this idea that uh, somehow uh, Trump is against the endless wars and against uh, use of the, uh, anyway. But, yeah. Ricardo, any, any reflections at this stage? Uh, yeah, I, I would, I would uh, firstly say, I, 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 of course, uh, and I'd say there are two moments. The one is colonization. Uh, Namibia is one, but I, I think we have to go uh, to look at colonization and its uh, totalitarian imperialist logic. But but I use South Africa because after 1953, they had this 50-year uh, rule, right? Uh, and sort of uh, makes this pact with the, with the white working class um, and sort of provides them as double asset welfare. Um, yeah, I doubt in, in the, 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 the current crisis, I think, doesn't allow for a project of uh, 
uh, welfare exclusively for a white working class. I, I think what is interesting here is that uh, you, you have this uh, capitalist project by both um, um, the Biden and the Trump. And uh, what I foresee is this militarized, racialized terror that could be unleashed on, on certain uh, groups and classes that we already see at the border. Um, and, and some of these, interesting enough, was already unleashed by Obama, if you, if you think about the immigration and the militarization and putting kids in cages. So uh, these, these, for me, are the two factions of uh, capitalist ideology. Um, and I think with the nature of the crisis, I think it's inevitable that uh, one of the response, and, 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 and for me, the ideological appeal is important. Um, yeah, where the two converge is for me very interesting. Both uh, Biden and Trump con sort of condemn uh, protests. Uh, for the Biden under the pretext of looting is wrong and all of this. and. For Trump was more an outright attack on the left. I mean, in his speech, he's saying the Marxists, uh, the, the anarchists, and, and, and uh, the leftists in general, which all of these groups he described, none of them you will necessarily find in the Democratic Party, right? So it's a different group that they are attacking because of the nature of the crisis. You have a clamoring and an uprising from below. At the same time, you have uh, right-wing groups also emerging, and there's this uh, contestation. Uh, I would say what the, the other important point is how the, uh, uh, a Trump win, as, 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 as Bill, Professor Martin rightly says, will embolden sort of right-wing forces, even in the global south. Uh, I was struck by uh, some, uh, I mean, uh, one of our, uh, for example, in South Africa, I'm using that example. Uh, one of the opposition Black uh, African Christian Democratic Party saying, I'm praying for Trump to win, you know. Uh, and, and I was like struck by this uh, logic that is this how this fossil appeal is just becoming uh, generalized. Uh, of course, I think what we have to watch, and I would be for, for Bill, is also the emergence of a right wing ideology amongst Black people. And that is the, the, the example of South Africa that there are also uh, classes and forces that previously would you think is just a white supremacist project? No, that there are also black uh, classes being absorbed into that project. And the South African example would be Bantustan leaders that sort of bought into. In the US, I would say is your washed out rap stars and these African descendants of slaves. Uh, so that is uh, where, but nevertheless, uh, what we are seeing is a convergence in the street by, uh, by a host of forces that is very, uh, that, that includes, I mean, racism is a social construct, of course, but includes different class categories of people that are converging. And I think both the Democratic and the, 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 the Republican and the Trump are trying to, to cross that uprising that is emerging in the streets. And so it's an interesting process of how that would unfold. Thanks, Ricardo. Thanks, uh, Professor Silva. Uh, Professor. Carlos Eduardo is here. Uh, Professor Carlos, you've been watching uh, from Brazil. Uh, it's an interesting space to watch from, but you've, yes. been watching, yes. you've been watching the US from Brazil. So yes, may, yes. May, I, may, may I invite you for your, uh, for your reflections and comments on how do you see these relative spaces? Yeah, you, we are uh, watching uh, from here, the situation at the States uh, with uh, uh, very concern uh, about the results uh, because uh, Bolsonaro has a lot of support of, of Trump and uh, I think it's uh, very important to change uh, the political game in Latin America that uh, Trump uh, will be uh, defeated in the content in the United States. So uh, we are watching here with uh, very concern about uh, the results. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's my comment now. Thank you. Professor Paris, are you also watching uh, the U.S. elections from Brazil? 
would you want to add a comment to what uh, carlos <laughs> has already mentioned yes uh, thank you to uh, professor silver ricardo jacobs bill martin and uh, carlos who has joined us uh, i also see praveen praveen ja here thank you all for a wonderful and illuminating uh, conversation today uh, yes, we have been watching, as Carlos has said, with great concern. Uh, there is uh, a, a very close relationship between Trump, of course, and Bolsonaro. Um, it was always a question, um, and it's an open question, uh, what the relationship would be if Biden wins. Of course, uh, the, the Bolsonaro and the whole political establishment in Brazil has... Um, given uh, U.S. corporations and the U.S. government great favors, uh, um, opening up the economy sector to seeding uh, a, a, a base up in uh, the state of Maranhão in the north. In the north. Uh, I think by like all that, I think Biden will be against any, any of, of that, uh, of those favors that, um, that, that Bolsonaro has already given to. But, um, you know, uh, of course, there's uh, much, if Bolsonaro, if Trump lost, yes, there, there would be a, a, a different game here as well. Yeah, because uh, the, the, uh, it will take out the wind out of the sails. I, uh... I think uh, Professor Paris's uh, uh, connection is is not live. Uh, he's disconnected, and and I think it's it's the uh, Professor Paris. Can you hear me? Uh, so the screen is frozen. So he's disconnected. Yeah, we have uh, lost him, Sandeep. Yes, uh, Professor uh, Jha, you were wanting to make a, a, a comment. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, in general sense and perhaps questions as well. Yeah, a, a couple of uh, comments, uh, essentially around the idea. And this is uh, basically, uh, I mean, let me first of all uh, uh, express my gratitude to everyone, Beverly, Ricardo, Bill, Paris, Carlos, and so on for. Uh, very insightful issues raised and so on. Uh, I'm raising something very specific uh, for your reflection, Beverly, uh, which is where can we see the rays of hope? Is it at the current juncture? Are there some things which either in the context of very immediate, you know, Biden versus Trump, and if Biden wins, would you see that as some kind of substantive uh, uh, or even a small ray of hope? Uh, what would constitute the moves forward in that direction and so on? So if you could reflect a little more on some of these issues. As regards the current conjuncture, I think it is impossible to understand the economics and politics of any establishment without really understanding the reconstitution of the class power and in particular, the finance capital and what it does. So what it does to the democratic establishment, what it does to the Republican establishment and so on. Uh, I think that is, very, very important in my understanding as regards responses both internally and externally. The world in that sense is a very different place in the last 30, 40 years compared to what it used to be, let's say, immediately after the Second World War and so on and so forth. Three, in terms of imperialism, I think there is very little to choose, whatever the likes of Yash Tandans may say, but, you know, between the Democrats and the Republicans, if we go by the history of the long 20th century and 
thereafter, I think we have to essentially acknowledge the differences in format, how the strategies were finessed and so on, right? how you know it was more uh, sort of a difference of form, so to say, yeah, and not really substance in any fundamental uh, manner, right? Uh, that is again um, sort of from the point of view of uh, the South at large, yeah? Uh, does it really make a difference? And to the extent, even at the level of form, what kind of differences you foresee? Suppose Biden is finally the president, right? In terms of the concerns that Ricardo was raising, of course, there could be again small differences. Uh, for instance, on questions of climate, on questions of ecology, you know, it may be a little bit better, but how much would that little bit be? I mean, if you have any reflections on, you know, sort of uh, some of these issues on questions of, for instance, um, what the different establishments do. I mean, I would say that it's not uh, a simple binary in terms of welfareism and not welfareism uh, as regards the two regimes, but it is graded kind of welfareism for the rest, for the non-whites, yeah. And, you know, there is very little that the Republicans can offer, but possibly, the Democrats may probably, and again, historically, if we see how it has panned out, yeah, even in Obama's time, for instance, healthcare, when I mean, we can't really dismiss that as, uh, you know, of no consequence. Yeah. So I think we need to sort of certainly have a kind of a nuanced understanding on many of these issues which then link us to the question of what I began with. Do you see rays of hope if indeed Biden becomes victorious in this presidential race? Or you don't see possibilities of that in any substantive sense? Let me stop here, Sandeep. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Professor Praveen Jha is, is at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in India. Uh, may I uh, may I uh, pause a moment for reflections from Ricardo or Professor Silva on some of the comments raised from Brazil and, of course, uh, latest by Professor Jha. Ricardo, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, 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 my, my characterization of the differentiated nature of how the crisis of experience uh, was not suggesting, and 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 I and I when I used the uh, South African guy who was saying this black person is praying for Trump, is precisely I think you you are correct that a defeat of Trump would also signal. Uh, and sort of slow down the right wing turn, even in the global south, um, where there's increasingly some affinity. So uh, for, for me, there are two ways in, in which I see uh, the rays of hope emerging. The one is, uh, the, 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 in, earlier on I raised the issue of the 1,100 um, strike event. Uh, that is a new wave, not just strikes, but wild, wildcat strikes. Uh, that have emerged since uh, uh, February. So it means labor is again entering into the fray. Um, and of course, the ongoing struggles against um, uh, police violence. And, and so if you think about uh, cities like Portland, it went on for 100, more than 100 days of consistent uh, struggles, uh, even when the state intervened. So I think um, in, in some sense, what, what, what a Biden victory 
uh, would do is to slow down the fastest field, right? But at the same time, one has to look at the margin of victory, that the country is very uh, uh, split, right? Uh, but however, uh, what, what I would see is this, this, this ray of hope is for a truly left project to emerge uh, that is linked to the real existing struggles that is emerging in, uh, from below um, and the contestation even for the white working class in, in, in some sense. Uh, uh, we have seen that the struggle at this historical period is led by a sort of the black working class in particular, but also the indigenous struggles against extractivism. These are the, the two forces that have been leading the struggle in this current conjuncture. And I think it, and it opens itself for the left project. Uh, what was truly remarkable of all of these things is the cross class nature and also the so-called race structure of the protest from below. Um, and I think if there's a, a left project that is going to emerge from uh, uh, Biden presidency, I think it will allow for, for us to think about beyond a project, beyond the two um, uh, factions of the capitalist ruling class, the Democratic and the, the Republican. And I think therein lies the, the rays of hope if we pay attention to uh, the self-activity and struggles that is unfolding from below um, without essentializing it. But I think we have to bring back labor into the discussion, which which it showed to us. We have to think about the social process as it's unfolding within the U.S. So, so I think for me, it is in that thing slowing down the fastest project and appeal. Um, but uh, we have already seen with the hege with and, and I agree with you with the uh, dollar hegemony. While uh, Trump uh, administration was promoting uh, nationalism, uh, the, the U.S. Fi finance led uh, through the Fed and others. <laughs> Uh, were trying to secure the, 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 the dominance of the dollar. Uh, so there was sort of a disjuncture between the two uh, uh, classes, but, it's, but I think it's just a normal operation of the dominance of finance capital uh, within the political fray as well. Um, should, uh, should I go next or no? So um, anyway, I think I, I agree with uh, what Ricardo has said and, uh, I think the question is, you know, which is the situation that creates greater space for a left political project to emerge, and uh, my both both in the United States and globally, um, and my sense is that uh, that the the field of struggle I improves marginally. In other words, if it for it doesn't solve any problem, but it potentially opens up a little more breathing space to, to, uh, to fight back. Now, this is the, the, the problem is the comparison with what happened after the Obama uh, election. So there was a big mobilization of youth and, and, and uh, around the election of Obama. And then the, the movement demobilized itself as soon as Obama was elected. If something like that were to happen here, or there was like a stepping back from mobilizations, uh, you know, uh, with the election of Biden, if he were to be elected, then that would be a, a disaster. Um, but uh, if I think there, there probably won't be, a, a, there won't be, but I don't think there will be because I think people have learned from the, uh, there has been a learning experience and the crisis has only gotten deeper uh, since 2008. So I think that that this kind of opposition is just much deeper and stronger. I think uh, the problem, again, I think that the, 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 the repression will be much harsher, um, Trump. Now to back, but that's, you know, Again, that's not where the hope is. The hope—it's—it's it, just like a mar. It's again, it's a, uh, and and it and it it it's also you know this. It's the context. It's and and um, that again, is if there isn't an emotion in in the process in order to somehow try to protect Biden from from the right, but I don't see it happening. Um, but we'll see. In terms of um, 
class power in, in terms of finance power, in terms of uh, Professor Jia's question. I think that um, you know what's been happening over the last 20 years um, and continues to happen day by day by day is the United States and the West more generally gets weaker uh, in terms of its economic weight, in terms of its uh, cultural weight, in terms, you know, I mean, again, this this whole election debacle will be like another uh, drop in, in cultural uh, weight in the world, ability to, you know, even with a straight face, tell anybody else how they should run their countries. And so um, I think that, that, um, that the corresponding progressive uh, response would be to precisely treat the United States as increasingly irrelevant and to build a world and a project that's you know based uh, whether it's a, some kind of new bandung or whatever but to build a project that is not where the US is just some uh, you know something there a, sm a small declining provincial type of uh, uh, region then you know the the uh, so, you know, I mean, this is also in the finan financial power. It's like the, the debt, you know, the, the, the size of the U.S. debt. And again, the, eventually the dollar cannot hold if there's an alternative, you know. And so all these things will come to in. In terms of, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, and, and on the geopolitical, I also agree with uh, Praveen that, you know, there's this uh, mar marginal differences. There's all Democrat, Republican, and big part of the left in the United States, you know, that consider themselves left are attached to this idea of the of U.S. power in the world. And, uh, and so, you know, that's something that just needs uh, to be fought back against and not, and, and not get dragged into. And I think, you know, the ones who are, again, most likely to get dragged into this are more, well, anyway, let, let me just not say. So in terms of the uh, rays of hope, there's, uh, you know, around the world, there's this massive mobilizations uh, of uh, demanding uh, a, a fundamental, that a fundamental transformation that they're movements that cannot be accommodated without a re radical restructuring of everything, um, including basis of livelihood, ecology, uh, security. And, and uh, so, you know, uh, this is, this is the, the, the clash is that there's a rejection from the majority of the world's population about this setup, about the deepening crisis and also pointing in the direction of where things have to go, uh, pointing in the directions of, of the solutions uh, to these crises. Thank you. Uh, you know, Professor Archana Prasad just written in and uh, you're talking of marginal differences and perceptions and hopes it can give. So she's just writing in, I, I, I note the comment here. She yeah. says, quote unquote, in India, the loss of Trump will not change the material reality but it will certainly help the forces resisting fascism in India. It will give a signal to the fast that fascists can be defeated in, even in liberal democracy and perhaps uh, help increase the space for struggle. So th there is there is that uh, mm -hmm. that side to the story which she's talking about in terms of uh, what difference will it make between the two. So it will give a ray of hope to those targeted in India that repress repressive uh, rulers can be debated. Uh, some optimism to the fight against neoliberalism and it gives some hope in terms of uh, the release and from the coercion that, that is being faced, especially for women's rights activists. So I, I think that there is there is that aspect that Professor Prasad touches on uh, yeah. to the comments you have made, Professor Silva. And I, I also uh, invite other questions uh, Colleagues who are with us uh, on, on the Facebook uh, live as well as on the Zoom here. Uh, we have the final few minutes and I uh, take this opportunity to invite your thoughts and comments uh, to our esteemed panelists and others who are here. And may I ask you, uh, in the meanwhile, uh, one, one comment or one question. Uh, how do you see, you know, you, you, you put a lot of faith in 
in in in in in uh, people struggles not getting co-opted this time having learned a lesson uh, after the backstabbing that happened in 2008 uh, that that we, we we all discussed here uh, or, or a kind of or, or a kind of you know uh, cut off that happened uh, so do, do you really think uh, uh, that that uh, struggles are more united and the fragmentations uh, that we talk of more generally and even in the us uh, what would be your comment on it uh, one big fragmentation that i kind of alluded to uh, was the fragmentation between the indigenous people's uh, resistance and that of the working classes uh, on the question of uh, decolonization and stolen land so so how do you see this uh, this kind of contradictions being resolved uh, are there efforts what 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 kind of comments would you have uh, on, on the latest on on, on that front uh, on 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 struggles coming together people's mobilizations coming together across uh, the the various axes that uh, ricardo you and professor silva you talked about Can you... Do you want so, me to go first? Do you want to go you, first? Would you like to make a comment or, or should I ask for more questions? Yeah, yeah. Would you like to make um, a comment on this? Yeah, yeah. I, I um, of course, the, what one can uh, uh, one can think of me as uh, the ideal optimist. <laughs> but I, I think we, we should pay careful attention uh, to the, the uh, indigenous struggle. And I think uh, when when the Standing Rock struggle emerges, right? It, it started off as indigenous people. It, it, it achieved two things. One, uh, the fragmentation among the indigenous people were for a moment, they came together to resist uh, the Keystone Access Pipeline uh, and the Dakota Access Pipeline. But something more, more interesting happened in that space. Um, is that there was a descendant of like you had 4,000 veterans uh, going there. There was a synergy mm. between the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, struggles and the indigenous struggles, right? Uh, they had that massive uh, protest in Chicago. And so there was an emerging, uh, I think, uh, uh, potential that, that is emerging where people beginning to understand uh, the nature of the uh, conversion of the struggle. Um, of course, the key thing of the settler colonial project is always to create certain racial hierarchies. Uh, and of course, one of its uh, key aims is to, of course, eliminate indigenous people. Uh, but uh, there has been a consistent resistance against uh, this. Uh, and, and, and so I think be between the same with the struggles on the street, uh, which has got a disproportionate attention. Uh, uh, people are focusing on the street, but there was also labor struggles that are emerging. And if you mm. think about uh, the militant nurses and teacher strikes uh, that were consequential in cities like New York, determining how, when the school should be open or not. And we, we, we pay less attention. We, we sometimes focus on the spectacle, you know, what is happening on the street. And I think uh, for me, there is where the, the convergence is between uh, a labor, ecological, uh, and sort of race struggle. And, 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 and I think we have to, the, 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 the left have to confront this question of uh, uh, what are the demands in the 21st century? Uh, uh, and I think one of the weaknesses that the left in the US, and I, it might be true somewhere else, is always trailing behind uh, the the masses struggle, you know, and then uh, we always have to trail behind because it just erupts and then we don't know what's going on uh, and we should pay attention to it. And of course, uh, there's an ideological contestation of who controls uh, this particular struggle. But let me not continue, but one of the key things that I wanna conclude with is that the black middle class within the democratic party has always fulfilled the role of creating so-called as protests and strike breakers. Uh, yeah, conveyor uh, belts. And, 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 and ideologically that also has to be contested, you know, and, and it does create a crisis for forces like the democratic socialist 
uh, of America that is tied to the democratic project. And it, it, it does force us to rethink this, this, this entire way in which we think about organizing. Thank you, Ricardo. Dr. Ricardo, thank you. Uh, any, any comments or questions, uh, friends? Uh, so, S Sandeep, oh, go uh, ahead. Paris, Paris may have uh, uh, managed to reconnect. So since we Let lost me... him midway, just check with him. And uh, Ricardo, yes. uh, just, just, just uh, you know, uh, sort of in a lighter vein, it's not only the problem of the left in uh, US that it always trails <laughs> behind the masses, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's a global phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. but, so but that, time... does it on 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 that on on that point, <laughs> Professor? On that point, does does uh, does the left not need to trail behind the masses? I mean, I would have thought uh, everybody needs to trail behind the masses. <laughs> but anyway, I want to come back to At Professor. Least that's Yaros. the only force with the masses, yeah. Correct. It <laughs> has to have the coherence with the masses. It's, it, it's the only force with the masses right now. <laughs> All right. So, if uh, Paris is there, otherwise we can uh, yeah, yeah, uh, please yeah, go yeah, back. No, to I, want, I want to go. go I, I I want to go across mm -hmm. to Professor Paris. He's back, and uh, yeah, sorry, Marcelo. In case you have a comment, yes, Professor Paris. Very yes, quickly, sorry about the I connection. just wanted to endorse endorse uh, what uh, Eduardo had said. That uh, uh, of course there will be uh, a new game in in Brazil if uh, Bolsonaro is defeated. Yeah. Uh, but that does not mean that we're going to be there will be an antagonistic relationship between a Biden presidency and extreme right fascistic uh, government here, because uh, Bolsonaro has delivered to the United States everything that a U.S. president would ever want. He's delivered, you know, the oil sector. He's delivered a space station in the north, which can be used for all types of military uh, uh, means uh, and purposes. Uh, everything that you, Biden would would be very pleased, yeah, with that. Anyway, so my connection is no good. <laughs> thank you, Sorry. thank you, and I, I will invite a final round of comments uh, from from our key speakers today, Professor Silver and uh, Professor Jacobs. Uh, but before that, uh, if there are any further last uh, comments uh, to those who are there and those who are on Facebook. The final few minutes, we have the final few minutes of this, uh, what has been a very, very interesting and thought-provoking discussion, touching on various facets, uh, not just in the U.S., but, uh, not just global south, but what's really happening, unfolding on our planet. Any final comments or questions, friends, keep it coming. And if there are none, May I now invite you for your final conclusion, rem concluding remarks, uh, Professor Silva? Any final thoughts that you would like to like to leave us with? Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this has just has been a really stimulating, excellent uh, discussion. I've really appreciated everybody's uh, comments and thoughts and um, on the rays of hope, I think that I agree that the rays of hope are with these mass movements that are coming forward. And I think that what we are seeing, like let, let, if I just focus on the labor movement in the United States, that what's happening is this intertwining everywhere of what are labor movements and uh, other kinds of movements. So like this, I, that's idea that there's, again, is some kind of identity politics movements going on or that we can separate out class and race and gender is, is impossible. Um, so uh, the, I mean, there's a huge, one of the things in the opposition that's opened up is this huge uh, gender gulf in terms of this uh, women's mobilizations, as well as, uh, this kind of uh, labor related, uh, like Me Too as related to uh, labor movement that the uh, Black Lives Matter movement has been, again, very much working class uh, movements related to 
the people who are most experiencing pol police brutality on their way home at night from their jobs. Um, or, so uh, I think that the, uh, again, in, in terms of uh, if, if we look at this kind of totality of mobilizations across the globe, not just in the United States, then we not only see like a human spirit emerging, but also we see the kinds of uh, the fundamental uh, rejections of the capitalist project and of the suffering that's being caused by the crisis. And so uh, I, I would say, I would leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Beverly Silva. Uh, Ricardo, final thoughts from you, uh, leaving thoughts from you. Yeah, just just uh, briefly, and I want to touch on. I, I think for me, uh, the significant event was the murder of George Floyd, and the international response to that. You know, it, it was no small feat that you had uh, protests in London, or in Africa, and many parts of the world, and it does point us to the international dimension of struggle. Uh, uh, that we have to think about how. Uh, uh, the, 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 what, what's happening in the U.S. and in terms of uh, working class international uh, solidarity and struggle and how that can pan out. Um, I think with the convergence of the multiple cri crises of labor, uh, reproductive women and eco ecology, uh, it forces us to think about what would an international or worldwide uh, eco-socialist project mean uh, in the 21st century uh, with sort of uh, intermediary steps of course to get there. Uh, and, and so I think the, the outcome of the election, uh, either way, uh, it, it will require a response from below. Uh, the, uh, without that response from below, uh, I don't see any hope. And for me, my hope is in, in, in what is emerging from below and how that can be strengthened with a new uh, project, but also have an international dimension. Um, as uh, Samir Amin in his last words envisioned, I think that becomes more of a necessity in this historical period. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, I actually want to pick on um, a very interesting graph that you were showing, uh, Professor Silva, at the Arigi mm -hmm. Center. Uh, the graph of protests, and quite aside from the methodology of having arrived at it, it's an it's an interesting thought, uh, and and something that uh, I would propose to us organizers. Uh, I, I think uh, there's a lot of optimism in 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 the kind of uh, coalition of forces and struggles. Uh, you call them from below. I mean, there can be other categorizations, Dr. Jacobs, for the same. Uh, but certainly the defragmentation among social struggles and movements. And I think that's something as us organizers, I would propose for uh, to, to hold a session on, on what are our projections for uh, the social movements, uh, the struggles going ahead in this new decade. And I, I think that would be an interesting conversation uh, from, from different perspectives of different, plan, uh, different continents on our planet. And I think that's something I'd, I'd like to leave us organizers with. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, to our keynote speakers, uh, Professor Bel Beverly Silva and Dr. Ricardo Jacobs for what has been a very stimulating discussion. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for your thoughts thank you. today. Thank you so much for thank you. your critique and optimisms as well. I would li also like to thank all of us, those, those who raised uh, comments and those who raised ideas from, from different spaces. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Thank you so much for ra raising questions. And as we come to the conclusion of this particular version, the ninth uh, in the series of our uh, dialogues for, plat for, for, for discussion, the, the platform for dialogues, I would like to thank the organizing team. I would like to thank all our supporting partners, uh, especially to our tri-continental logistics team, individuals, uh, colleagues like Joseph Mathai, Freedom, Freedom Mausi, Dr. Freedom Mausi, Nabajit Malakar, Isha Chaudhary, Priyanka. Priyanka, thanks also for the questions, uh, for following up on the questions today. And of course, uh, Julio Kambanko. Uh, friends, an announcement in the end. Do join us on the 18th of November. Uh, uh, our next dialogue series, the 10th, with Professor 
division kosi uh, uh, professor division kosi will talk about the wretched of covid 19 in brazil the colonial specters of an announced crisis november 18th at the same time same space i welcome you there watch out for it it's going to be an interesting perspective from what both eduardo and paris spoke to about so thank you so much good night good noon good evening wherever you are all the best see you two weeks all later right. thank you so much thank you to all, all bye right. bye 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 bye